So welcome. I'm John Leslie. I'm here today with Patrick Palm and Mark Kyle. And we're doing something a little bit different today. I'm still focused on remote, distributed, hybrid, but we're specifically going to be talking today about leading creatives in remote and hybrid type environments. So um, no delay, I'm just gonna pass it off to Patrick Palm to kind of talk a little bit about the background of Favreau and start the conversation with our special guest, Mark. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, good to be here. Uh, all right, you know, thank, thanks, John. Um, so, you know, very briefly, you know, for the ones of you that are not familiar with, 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 with Favreau or, you know, or, or, or Favreau, uh, you know, you can, you can pronounce it, you know, whatever way you want. Um, you know, the, the origin is real that my two fellow co-founders and I, we, we built uh, another company, which, which was um, a platform for agile software development in, in very large uh, teams. And what we saw was that um, people in other kinds of teams, you know, marketing, operations, et cetera, they also wanted to embrace these kind of you know, agile you know, product management techniques to, to run their things. So we thought um, this is probably something that's going to be big across you know, the whole, whole organization. And, and we were right because today business agility is, is definitely very, very high up on the agenda for you know, both uh, you know, fast growing um, you know, SaaS companies, you know, scaling, you know, maybe they brought in some venture capital, they're adding people by the day. And, and, and you know, there's some growth pain that comes with that. And, and they want to make sure they don't lose, you know, that agility that they had, you know, when they were just a few people in a room. And uh, all the way up to, you know, big enterprises that are, are you know, running strategic initiatives around, you know, agile transformation. So, so we kind of, you know, get, get going on that. And, you know, the core of the product is really that, it is a tool for collaborative planning and you know leading collaborative planning, and the re reason this is so important is because you know if you are an organization that are thinking about business agility, you really need to make a choice. You know what kind of you know leaders do you hire? Uh, what kind of how do you organize? Um, but you also need to think about the tools that you choose. You know, let's say that you have very you know autonomous teams. Um, you know, you have um, you know a good kind of structure. You know how how, how these scales. Uh, you know, but then you go and pick, um, you know, a more traditional enterprise tool which builds on on centralization or processes. You know, you're killing a lot of that um, agility that you tried to create in the first place. And 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 tools uh, and like, for example, incentive systems are 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 some of the most uh, important factors in in what we call organizational gravity. You know, the thing that kind of you know pulls uh, you know pulls you to towards a certain you know pole. And um, yeah, so all in all, um, you know, tools matters, you know, more, more than, you know, most organizations think. Um, so so that, that's, that's the thing that we wanted to fix. So we created Favreau um, and, and, you know, typically people have used um, things like, you know, your spreadsheets or Trello or, you know, things like this before. And they want something that can handle the complexities of, of the work that they're doing. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, they want to, to avoid a more traditional enterprise tool but still, you know, the IT department will demand that, you know, it has, you know, enterprise grade security, data governance, and you know, all those kind of things, as, especially now that's important with, you know, GDPR and, and, and all that. And, and, and you know, and, and Favre is a platform for exactly that. So that's how we got into this industry. That's, that's, the, that's the whole background. Now, we, we do, one of the best things, you know, with this is that we get to know um, some, some pretty, you know, cool clients, you know. Most of our customers are typically very fast-growing, you know, uh, SaaS companies or, or you know, modern game developers, etc. So that is the, um, the kind of you know, a main category of, of customers that, that right now are, are discovering Favro, and the people working at these companies tend to be, uh, you know, very inspiring. And and for for this webinar, you know, what we do is that we we invite you know people from from these customers to have a conversation about you know something related to. You know, future work and you know where where the workplace is really going now, which seems to be very much kind of a hybrid workplace. You know, coming out of COVID, you know, sooner or later. Um, and you know, I had the privilege to you know get to know you, Mark. But but we actually known each other for 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 quite a long time because you you were actually one of the first users of Favro and 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 uh, you know used it in, in very different kind of situations, all the way from recently organizing a film festival to. Uh, you know, to, you know, digitalization of, of a, a very traditional workplace. Uh, and you have a you know, big background in, in, in game development, you know, which is one of our, you know, uh, you know, big customer groups. So why don't we, you know, jump straight into just a little bit on, on, on your background, because 
just kind of quickly looking at your resume, it's kind of like, you know, wow, this, this, this guy's been doing a bit of everything. And how, 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 how did this happen? You know? <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, Patrick, you know, the main thing, you know, I, we talked the other day, you know, and I've been thinking about this in terms of, you know, leading creatives and what kept drawing me back to, you know, to, to that, you know, role. Um, and I find myself in throughout my whole career, you know, I started out as an architect. That's what I was trained as, as an architect in the 80s. Um, and I've always been a passionate about creating and the creative process in particular um, and how innovation and tech can play in that process and how it impacts that process. Um, so uh, being trained as an architect back in the 80s, you know, we had the firm that I was working with doing my internship, we had a, a CAD system and that was like, whoo, you know, this is fancy 2D, you know, you could draw with, with a computer. I mean, that was big in the 80s. Uh, but it, it grabbed me, you know, um, and I started managing that. And we actually started developing 1990 was a huge year because uh, for me, at least in my career path, because the Mac 2FX was released. And that was actually the first Macintosh that would actually do 3D. Um, and we were really pushing the tech at that time with a little company out of, out of California called Electric Image Animation System, which was a 3D rendering system that worked on the 2FX. Uh, started doing a lot of things with 3D visualization. This is in 89, 90, 91. That wasn't really done that much. It's now commonplace. Um, but that really got me in, involved in looking at the creative process and how technology impacts that and the importance of tools. You know, back then we didn't have, you know, cloud-based tools or anything like that. You know, having Excel running on a Mac Classic and FileMaker to have cards, I always managed in a agile, a, a, an agile way. I used, you know, cards and stuck them on a board and moved them across the, across, you know, a whiteboard. Um, but we started doing that digitally. Um, you know, moving on from there, one of the things that happened with that, though, during that time, I got a, uh, we were doing this 3D, 3D visualization work, and I got a call from a producer uh, with, that worked with Dick Wolf out of New York, and he was doing, he wanted to do a series in, in Florida that, pre-visualized stunt sequences in 3D. Now, this had not been done yet. This was the first time uh, Brooke Kennedy was the producer um, that had the idea. And she approached me through a recommendation from Electric Image. And I went down and we spent, you know, four months down on location in Miami Beach and South Beach. And that was a real turning point because, you know, we were using and, and managing, um, you know, a show every six days we were shooting an hour show so it was very very lots of moving parts and again the waterfall scheduling wouldn't work for that you know so it, that that eventually led me into creating a visual effects company through the 90s and that's really what i did throughout the 90s until 99 when i uh, moved to shaw island uh, retired from my visual effects company and moved to shaw island in the san juan islands and got involved with gaming um actually at that time that's when the original Microsoft, the first Xbox, was being developed because it released in 2001, November. I had a friend, an old high school friend that lived, that worked for Microsoft for years, and he asked me to be involved in helping them get content done for the games. So we did all the stadiums, for example, for, uh, for NFL Fever. We were doing all the stadiums and feeding them in. I was out on a remote island, and all my staff <laughs> was uh, at Korea and California in Florida and in Singapore. And that's, and we had, we were all over the place, uh, but we were able to pull that all together to a distributed team. So I've been familiar with that for quite some time. And that's how I got into the game industry and then moved on to uh, electronic arts and then a gig with LucasArts as their operational director where we were doing Star Wars Force Unleashed. Um, then I was a ski for 10 years. <laughs> and that's where I got involved using Favro. Because prior to that, I used all a product that you used to be involved with, Handsoft. And I got involved with that. And when you sold that off the perp force, and I was working on creating a system to manage lift maintenance for a ski resort, mm -hmm. to manage the maintenance of lifts. And that was a bottom-up thing because that was as a I wasn't a manager in that situation. So all my life I've been managing kind of top down, you know, managing teams. Now I came, I was part of a team and I had to kind of push up, yeah, you know, yeah. from the bottom yeah. up. So it was a different experience. It was quite, quite, quite phenomenal. But, you yeah. know, it's just being passionate about creation is really what's been dri dri driving me back to creative aspects. 
so, know, create a project. I mean, you know, you, you know I, I, the, the story you were telling me there about the island, it was kind of like, you know, if we would have just have excluded um, the, the year you mentioned and, you know, just, just made a story about kind of, you know, your setup, how you were working, yeah. you know, with people in different places. And so, you know, that might have been 2020 or 2021, yeah. you know? <laughs> it, no, no, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the new normal in COVID, right? Working yeah. remotely, uh, you know, and pulling your strengths from your team members wherever they may be located. Yeah, yeah. It was difficult back then because we were in dial. Yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were sending files via via the FedEx airplane, you know? So it was, oh, wow. That's <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you know, go, going back to the thing, we, you know, with, uh, with with leading creatives. I mean, um, as, you know, very often when I um, when I get into to this kind of conversation, because you know, now you know, more than fifteen years, you know, in various ways, you know, helping with production in in game development and and and, and also you know many other industries. But but especially, you know, I, I, I just I just like game development a lot because it's that mm-hmm. combination of it's something truly creative that comes together with. A lot of very interesting technical challenges and it, it is at such a big scale that also you know all these organizational challenges come in so it's just it's, it's a couple of you know hard things that you know comes together you know in, in, in like a perfect storm which is why I, I keep keep coming back to that specific example and I think also you know um, if we're looking at what's happening today you know in, in Hollywood in many ways I think I think um, you know the world of, of films and TV is in many ways becoming more like the game industry rather than the other way around. You know, I remember mm-hmm. you know, 10 years ago, it was kind of like, you know, when you were in game development, you kind of looked up to the film industry, but you know, now you know, the game industry is three times as big as the movie industry. And you know, the last 12 months, you know, the movie industry has struggled and game developers um, that managed to kind of figure out how to operate, you know, in a remote way have been, have been thriving. So, so it's, um, you know, it, there's a bit of a convergence, I think, we're seeing there. And, and you know, you mentioned, you know, VFX and, you know, there's, there's a few VFX clients of Favre, actually. We had, you know, a great um, uh, webinar before, you know, here uh, this summer with, you know, uh, with, you know, Nico, you know, who, who's at one of those companies. And I thought that was a good talk. Um, so so what I want to get get into here is a little bit the whole, you know, people might say that, well, hold on a second, you know, creativity and process, it just doesn't go together. Uh, you know, the title of this webinar, you know, leading creatives is, you know, it's even like controversial in some, some years, you know, it's like, no, you can't lead, uh, you know, creativity. Um, can you just get a little bit into, into that? Because this is something which is, you know, truly hard and, and, and almost a bit of a mystery to, to many. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's something I've run into my entire career, but one being an artist myself and in, 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 in some ways wanting to shun process but then also seeing the importance of process uh, and that it's actually not, to me, it comes down to even, even a, a basic thing. There's a, a, a book called How to Fly a Horse by Kevin Ashton. And one of the things he says in there is about creativity. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, creativity, it's not, it's not so much, you know, we, I, I think, and I tend to agree with him on this. It, it's, it's a myth that it's just all of a sudden a, that the creative is just a, uh, uh, this magical kind of mysterious spark that happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, the creative process is really observation, evaluation, iteration. Uh, you know, that, that's really what you're doing. It's not a sudden shift of perception, but it's, you solve the problems that leads to creation that leads to another problem that you want to solve. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's why process is so important. And even like in game development, you know, particularly in game development, you've got you know, if you want to have that, uh, you know, autonomy of autonomy, uh, obviously, you want to have that collaboration and the coordination. And that's not just at the level of it's at the level of the individual, mm-hmm. at the level of the team, of the department, and then of the overall organization. You've got those whole things stacked. The bigger the organization is, yeah, the yeah. more there those levels. But as you concentrate on that, you know, that process of observation, evaluation, iteration, it doesn't stifle you at all. In fact, it empowers me. Yeah. You know, and, I, and now I'm using Favreau. I'm I, I don't I'm not building another company. I'm building I'm doing my own projects and working with, you know, a film festival and a museum doing things with them. But, uh, you know, I can get a lot done with very with very little labor simply because I automate a lot of that process that I can plug. Th- so I, oh, there's a lot of things I don't have to think about yeah. that uh, that I can automate that are very helpful. So it's it's not a it's to me processes is not uh, is not a, an inhibitor. It can be if it's a top down and you don't look at the actual uh, what the people that are creating the actual the, the end the end creator is actually yeah. doing and how that 
feeds into everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I would like to get your comment on something because you know when when you talk about it, you know you. You know, it's like with you know any great athlete, you know they make it look easy, right? <laughs> and it's kind of like when you when you think about it, you know you make it look, you make it sound uh, easy, which is great. But but if I just look at some very typical patterns, you know, in 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 creative industries, you know, very often what happens is that, you know, um, when a company becomes you know too corporate, um, you know, they start to centralize all processes, they start to send you know do, you know, these kind of you know very. Um, centralization oriented you know tools etc uh, you know and the reason this happens might be that you know they're just going through you know an ipo and they're a little bit like okay you know now we, we need to to do those things i actually find that people that well companies that have been on uh, listed for a long time are a little bit more chill about that to be honest um so they kind of gone full circle but but anyways you know what i what i want to get to here is the whole there's a bit of a dynamic going on where you know you know a company grows uh, for various reasons, it becomes more corporate, and 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 the, and the best creatives feel like, okay, this is suffocating me, uh, and they quit, and then they yeah. join um, you know, maybe a startup, uh, and sometimes it can be the situation that this startup have raised, um, you know, some serious venture capital, um, but they just, you know, they're like no process. It's like sailing a boat where you know all the ropes are loose, you know. And at some point they run out of money and, you know, the people then go to, to yet another place. But then you have these, these, you know, new companies that kind of manage to strike that, you know, that balance, you know, where, you know, it's, it's like, you know, what Einstein said, you know, things should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I guess it's the same with process, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you should have as little process as you can, but not less. And, 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 and I guess it's also, you know, it needs to be, you know, like the right process. So what I would like to ask you is like, you know, do, do, you, do you agree with this kind of analysis that this tends, this kind of, you know, dance tends to go on all the time? Is, is that a correct observation? And, and, and two, if so, what is it that these, you know, these companies, you know, you know they kind of get it right? You know, what, what, what is the core of what it is that they get right? Well, I think when you look at this, you know, particularly with, it happens more, it happens more often than not. I think with the, you know, the, that scenario you just described. And I think the really key, at least for me, I've done a lot of consulting as well with, you know, on process, primarily in the gaming industry as well. But it, and it's the kind of common thread is where, where that, or, that organ, organizational gravity that's good, that's helping that, that startup grow or helping a company, for example, a large corporation that uh, already exists that, has, that does mergers, that does acquisitions and mergers. That's what I was part of in a ski resort situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have acquisitions and mergers and, and where you need that kind of common thread that everybody's or, you know, common sheet of music that everybody's playing from. The problem gets into is that a lot of times when it's a, when it, when it, when that process is defined top down, like this mm -hmm. is how we, this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. That's a, some, I run into that all the time. Well, this is how we've always done it. Well, that's the problem right now. You know, the, the one thing about the creative process, I'm constantly uh, revising or, or, you know, tweaking that process. It can mm -hmm. always be more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so you, it's not a one and done kind of thing. You know, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's never a one and done kind of thing. But I think a mistake a lot of big companies, when they get to that point where, you know, they've got that the momentum and they're larger, they, they you, you, you get management defining a process that might not be actual the, the best process for mm -hmm. their teams to work through mm -hmm. and they kind of impose it on the teams versus letting that uh, you know looking at what is the actual process between these mm -hmm. art the, the artists here building these uh you know assets and the and the game programmers that need these yeah. and all those dependencies you really got to build that process from the ground up and not the yeah. top down yeah, yeah. Um, and, and many times we've course corrected. You know, when I went to LucasArts, they were two and a half years into uh, Star Wars Force Unleashed, the first film there. And we, you know, it was I, I went in as a director of operations and, you know, lots of talent there, tremendous amount of talent. But the, the collaboration just just the, the, the process wasn't there to enable and empower mm -hmm. everyone to make that thing happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we finally did. We got the right process in place. We got everything done and we finished the game and it did quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it was that we looked, the main thing I looked at there was what are, what are the processes we're using and do they match with the actual 
um, work that needs to be done and that the, av- the, the, the person sitting in a chair that's mm-hmm. actually doing the model or doing the programming, is it, does it work for them? Yeah. You know? and nine so, times out of 10, it didn't. Yeah. You know? and, and companies weren't functioning. So do you have, um, you know, I, I, think, I think, you know, a very scary step for, for you know, people that have a successful career um, in any kind of, you know, creative field and you know they're looking at a, an opportunity to take more of a leadership uh, role. I think I think many are feeling this is this is quite a scary step. Um, am I not going to be? You know, I, am I going to the dark side now? You know, to go back to Star Wars thing. And <laughs> and uh, uh, what would be your you know your your top advice? You know, to, to to someone who's just about to you know put on that hat of, or maybe we should you know like get, get some of those stripes on your shoulder. You know. I would say, you know, uh, particularly when you're picking a tool, um, don't let the tool, don't pick a tool that will dictate your process. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, you know, that, that the years of waterfall scheduling, you know, and particularly in game development, this, those are, you, this doesn't, it doesn't really work. I mean, it, you can get a game done, but it's not very efficient. I don't, you yeah, know, yeah. you're going to cut into your profit. But, uh, so, but, you know, being able to, um, really look at that um what's the right terminology i want to use for that um it, it you it's about you know picking your tool make sure that the tools that you use to define those processes don't force you into a process mm-hmm. that's the thing and that's why it's so scary you know it's very intimidating when you get this you know this big system let's say it's a system for project management this is how you're going to manage this game Mm -hmm. you know and it's you're making that jump and you're doing it and it's like make sure that that system whatever that is is not something that's pushing you into a a certain direction that you have to do unlike favro favro lets me i just i look the way i use favro the way i approach favro is i look at here's here's what i'm trying to solve for here's the creative problem so to speak Mm -hmm. that i'm going to observe evaluate and iterate on Mm -hmm. or my team is going to what can i put in place what processes can i put in place to kind of grease those sled grease that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. uh you know it, it's kind of <clears throat> i mean a couple of things you said there you know we could, we could probably just you know take and use us you know taglines for for favor um <laughs> you, know, you said you know don't don't let don't let the tool dictate your process i, I really like that one um absolutely um you know it's kind of a I, I, I saw um, uh, I saw a clip the other day about you know kind of summarizing what's known so far about Amazon's Lord of the Rings um, uh, you know up, upcoming series you know and and um, it's going to be second age um, it's kind of interesting it's to, to I'm obviously blowing my own trumpet here now uh, but but it's it's a little bit like um, you know, at last, and it's kind of like that Sauron who kind of keeps coming back. You know, because with mm-hmm. with, with the previous company, you know, Handsoft, you know, the, the the war was was a little bit different than now. The war was the, it was kind of like you know, game studios that you know had the money and they kind of had management in order. You know, they were picking Handsoft, and the ones that were, you know, a bit, you know, they, they just didn't have the money. You know, they were picking Jira. And and it was it was very interesting for us because we you know I mean we won customers and we lost customers and when we lost a customer, and, and they went to to Jira we knew that okay we, we could bet like okay nine months from now the company's bankrupt because it was typically a sign that they were doing some heavy cost cutting because they were in financial trouble and very often we were we were right, I think now if, if this is let's say the third age you know <laughs> for 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 right. me. Uh, uh, the the, the battle is actually a little bit different because you know Atlassian is it's, it's a very well run company. I have a massive amount of respect for them from from you know say a, a company point of view. It's just that the products are are, are very old fashioned, um, and and very much kind of you know the the best out of the previous age. So so, so now the battle is actually very different. Uh, now it's more around kind of you know corporate, um, you know versus collaborative. So uh, for for companies that you know they, they they want to be more corporate, they want to centralize processes. You know that that's where they're going. You know they they will you know buy into the whole you know Atlassian. You know they will drink the Atlassian Kool Aid, so to say. <clears throat> you know versus you know we see so many. It's kind of like you know when when you know you have some great talent. You know they spin out of a bigger company, they get some venture capital because they have an amazing idea, they have amazing resumes, and then they you know they pick Favro. Uh, so 
so, so, so it's, it's almost like new versus old and, 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 you know, collaborative, you know, versus corporate. So it's a little bit of a different battleground, to, you know, to be honest. Um, and I guess, you know, this is a, this is a webinar itse in itself, you know, talking more about kind of, you know, market dynamics and, you know, things like that. Um, so, so anyways, small interlude there, you know, um, obviously shamelessly blowing my own trumpet. Um, there might be other views on, you know, on, on the market, but, but, but that are some data parts of what's, what's happening. Um, you know, you kind of mentioned, you know, your use of, you know, uh, favor yourself and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a big movie buff. So I was very excited when I heard that you're organizing a film festival, but then I was like, this was 2020, you know, last year. And I was like, but you can't organize a film festival. So can you just, can you just tell the story? You know, what, what, what happened there? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I moved to the San Juan Islands uh, again for the second time, first time in 99, second time again in 2019, early 2019, mm -hmm. I, uh, I went to uh, that time I moved to a little smaller island called Orcas uh, mm -hmm. from the main island, Friday Harbor over in San Juan Island. I, I went over to San Juan because they had a film festival and I went over just to volunteer for it because I it's a documentary film festival and I'm very much focused on, you know, documentaries around environmental and social justice and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and uh, you know, they need some help. Uh, John, is it just for me it's frozen? I think, I think it's, I think Mark is frozen. Mid-sentence. <laughs> that was a cliffhanger. Can you just maybe send me a message to see if you just uh, restart soon? Yeah. That would be a little edit for you then, uh, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Post production stuff, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Jace is like, leave it in, it builds suspense. <laughs> That's good. Uh, okay, so in the meantime, you know, while, you know, John, if you just, um, you know, keep, keep communicating with Mark to see if you can kind of reboot to get back in. Uh, you know, if there's any questions, um, you know, this is a good time to uh, to to um, to send them. And uh, there's this little um, Q and A button. To be honest, actually, John, we've been extremely fortunate with having no like live mishaps with um, like yeah. this before. This is, it's kind of this, kind of fun. It's yeah, this it's pretty uh, pretty impressive actually that we. I, I heard a lot of. Um, kind of complaints about zoom recently there's been there's been a lot of kind of weird it's like in the beginning you know last spring you know the issue was people kind of doing you know i can't remember what it was called but you know when some kids would like jump into your zoom call so it was a bit of a security issue and they would i actually had that happening to me once you know in a in a in a rotary meeting and it was <laughs> at the same time as you know this amazing american lecture you know you know she was giving a lecture about something uh on the charity side and then the, there were these like kids who kind of jumped in and started like draw penises you know, on the screen and they're like, you get ugly here. And she was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, I felt so sorry for her. So that was the issue, you know, back then. Now it seems like there's more on the performance side in terms of issues. So connectivity know. problems. Yeah. yeah. I, I've had so much good luck with Zoom. This is a first. Um, you know, John, you've been, um, uh, you've been involved with um, a lot of these kind of projects where the whole challenge of leading creativity has been been quite central. You know, there's a pushback from the team that, oh, no, we don't want to have like any process. And, you know, the leadership of the company is like, well, we, we need some, you know. And I mean, you have a very long background as producer yourself, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean it's. I mean, going back to that, that kind of conversation with Mark. I mean, what what is your um your experience you know, with, with this particular in our challenge? I agree. I agree with what Mark was saying, and also what you were saying about, uh, especially with creatives, and especially creatives who have had a lot of success, uh, maybe at other studios or other organizations, or just personally, mm -hmm. it's it's very difficult to impose any sort of process on those particular ty creative types, right? So I've worked with studios of all different ranges where you know, they were very large organizations and the process was imposed from the top down, as Mark was saying. Uh, and then these smaller studios maybe had a lot of venture capital. Um, they, they were able to afford the best of the best, the superstars of the industry, so to say, and process is a taboo, right? No process. 
Uh, we've got to let the creatives be creative. And then, you know, they come up with lots of good ideas, but progress is very slow, if not non-existent, to getting to uh, something that's done, something that can, can be shipped out, that can be played or even early access for that matter. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that right now. I mean, I just read an article about uh, how much money Google, uh, Amazon and Google have spent on their first party game studios. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, that, that was a bit of a, that was a bit of a blow up uh, with Google now, right? Right, right. And, and, you know, we lost Jane and, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens in the next 12 months there. You can have, so exactly. I mean, the point being, you can have the best talent yeah, yeah. without process, a little bit of process, just yeah. enough process to, to get something done. Yeah. Uh, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mark, you're back. I made it back. Yeah, yeah. That was a construction issue. They just uh, cut my internet for a minute. I had to switch to a hotspot. <laughs> yeah, but we, we, can, we can see you clearly. We can hear you clearly. We, we okay, right good. <laughs> so this is off my phone. So. No, no worries. You know, we, we were like joking about like, okay, we, we're going we're gonna, to you know, cut this in post-production, but then you know, one of the participants was like, no, is it, is it built suspense? And, you know, <laughs> John and I had a little bit of a conversation, but we also have had a, like a really good question coming in here. So, you know, maybe I can kind of loop you back in here now on a, on a specific. Absolutely. So uh, the question is this. Okay. So what advice uh, do you have when you're bringing a new team that develops a different product, but the product, um, um, but the product is, 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 um, uh, let me see. But the product is needs working line and the complement of the existing product. Okay, I see what you. Okay, uh, is it best uh, to force them into the existing process or to find find a new process or uh, leave each on its own? Okay, uh, there's a book about this. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, have you read it, Mark? I have not actually. Oh, you should read it. I it's, will. I, I'm uh, always looking for a good book to take out yeah, one of my cards. That, 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 <laughs> that was describing, you know, this particular problem. But I mean, what's your experience? You know, okay, so you're doing something entirely new, uh, you know, within the within something old. Uh, okay. You know, should, should you, you know, try to do the new within the framework of the, the way you're working with the old? That might be quite um, mature, but maybe also potentially a little bit too too tight. Uh, or do you think that uh, you should simply just, you know, leave them by themselves or should you like proactively create like a, um, a, a new process for, for, for this, this kind of, you know, you know, new endeavor? endeavor. Actually, I, I would look at it as a combination. I, I, I would never just reuse an old process because that, that's when you're going to start getting into that situation where your corporate gravity works against you instead of for you. Yeah. You know, if you're just saying, okay, hey, this process worked on this product. Uh -huh. Now here's a completely different new, completely different product. There's, there is going to be a unique process for that product. It doesn't mean scrapping the old thing completely. It might, but yeah. it also might just mean taking that, that new product and looking at your old and then just iterating, iterating yeah. that, 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 uh, process, you yeah. know, again, observation, evaluation, iteration. So you, you look at that and say, how do I tweak this to make it for this unique product? But I definitely wouldn't just jump in and say, this is how we always do it. That's where you get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so do, I, do I interpret you right when you say that, you know, that alternative, which is kind of like, okay, so don't use the old one. Don't use, uh, don't use the old process. Uh, don't just let it float um, or drift, maybe it's the right term in English. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and actually go for that third option, which is like, you know, proactively try to think, you know, what is the best process for this particular situation? Do I Absolutely. The third option is, the, is really yeah. how basically I've approached projects yeah. throughout my whole entire career and still do to this day, because each one is going to be unique. I mean, we're yeah. problem solving. So, you know, it's not the same solution to every problem. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. process is problem solving. There's a unique process for that particular unique problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it might be based ninety yeah. percent on the old process. Yeah, it might, yeah. but it might yeah. not. You know, you have to be willing to yeah. look at it. I mean, you know, again, I, I could I could just cut out that section and use that's like a you know a, a pitch for favor because <laughs> the, the problem when you use say let's, let's say that you're standardized on 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 a, on a you know traditional enterprise tool and you know you're just trying to do something new and it's going to be like no you have to follow this particular process you know. 
and it's going to be very hard to change. Um, and uh, you know, in, in you know, in, in February, you know, all of these things kind of kind of you know coexist. Oh, by the way, I have I have, I have two questions for you now. So so I want to ask you about the film festival, but but just before that, um, in 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 you know, when John and I did a lot of these webinars in the summer, we actually got several times a question. I think it was from uh, audience in in America saying that like, is it pronounced Favro or Favro? You know, we we quite often say say you know Favro, and um, and I also like Favro, which is what often Americans say because it you know like your favorite tool. You know, sounds kind of good. Ah. I think that uh, a bit of the confusion is that um, if you look at how it's pronounced versus spelled, uh, you know, if you say Favro, it sounds like you know like John Favro. Um, <laughs> obviously, yeah. ha, ha, you know, now it's with with Mandalorian has be, you know got into like huge fame. Uh, and and um, but you know he, he spells it a little bit different and and I, 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 I can't swear on this but I think you know his family name is originally Italian and I think the the, the European way you pronounce it would actually be more like kind of you know Favreau. Uh but you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna swear on that but but anyways um, but I have I have this memory that didn't you work with him at some point in your career or did I get that wrong? Well, we uh, when I was at when I was at Lucas Arts. Mm -hmm. So in addition, one of the things we you know, talk about process, I think this is important because it makes a point, of, you know, you talk about new process, old process. One of the main things, uh, shifts that took place that we did in, in uh, Star Wars Force Unleashed was actually um, do, do some sharing collaboration with Industrial Light Magic. Because ILM, you know, here they were, they were downstairs. You know, we were on this floor at the Presidio. Yeah. They were on that floor and there was really no asset sharing going on. They had all these Star Wars assets, you know, so because but they're very heavy because they're for rendering. Right. They're, yeah. more, they're But there was ways and the, the tech directors actually we, we kind of pushed it in a direction where they started uh, then taking models. And it was more much more efficient to take mm -hmm. a really heavy model and reduce it. Then, you know, it's according to Canon. It's right. It's proper. It's going to pass George's mm -hmm. inspection. Um, and during that process, while we were doing that, they started making Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. And that was being done mainly in Singapore, all the, the, uh, the animation, but that 3D product. So in that, he was involved with that project as well. Mm -hmm. So peripherally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah peripherally. And, and, you know, what I, 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 I you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, you know, The Mandalorian, but I have to say that I was almost equally fascinated by the, the documentary that they produced. I think it was called Disney Gallery or something. Disney Gallery. Uh, where they basically made kind of like, you know, interviews, you know, how it was made. And, and I was fascinated by how um, progressive, you know, he seems to be uh, in, you know, in pushing, you know, for that, um, you know, next level of, 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 of technology being used, you know, with, I think they call it, is it, it's not it's not the boy actually uh, i think we actually have people in the audience that probably knows this very well but uh <laughs> there you go they uh they create this uh they, they basically use uh unreal uh to yes uh, to make, to make yeah. sure that you know the, the background you know they actually film stuff in real time you know it, it, yes. it's pretty amazing it's like it, it, you know the making the tv series almost like more similar to like a, a, a real-time rendered game, you know, than, than traditional, um, you, know, you know, movie production. You know, it's, it's absolutely. Like you know, and quite a bit of that tech, even yeah. that was, that was used, that was used in Star Wars: Force Unleashed too, to a degree, yeah, yeah. where it was really wonderful. We'd go on a soundstage with a camera and be in the scene. Yeah. Basically, so you could walk through and you knew where the action was happening. So a lot of role playing and things went went through, to, you know, just on some of the challenges and things yeah. and levels. But and, yeah, no, it's a vi virtual yeah, that whole virtual production yeah. methodology. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah, you know, there, there seems you know, you know that that whole you know the, the marriage of technology and process and and and, and creative. Uh, he just seems to be uh, one of the, the the people that truly gets that, and, and absolutely, yeah. this is something that holds you back, but sees the opportunity in how can this make us move forward, you know? And I mean, you can just look at the result. Mandalorian is awesome, so you know. Yeah, well, um, I think it's true across the board with technology, right? I mean, to me, again, technology, the creative process, you know, it, the technology just brings infinite possibility. I mean, how yeah, can yeah, I apply yeah. this? 
Yeah. You know, how can I take this? You know, it's back back in, you know, I'll go back real quick, back to the old days when we were first in a, my first visual effects company, Lightpoint Entertainment. What we were doing there, we were experimenting with a lot of things, motion capture, and you know, that's what it was all wired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. Flock of birds is what it was called. Yeah. <laughs> and we also had this, and it was we got we affectionately call it the flock of turds, but uh because it was not, <laughs> it was very difficult to wrangle. <laughs> uh, but you know, we also were dealing with some virtual set technology that was uh, just 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 coming out of the gate from Evans and Sutherland. And yeah. we had a strategic deal with them. We were doing some virtual set stuff, but that same technology, actually that wound up being that, that uh, ENS technology wound up being, you know, if you watch American football, you know, you, you, everyone's used to now there's that yellow line where the first down is, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's vir- that was kind of, that came out of that virtual set technology. Yeah, so you, yeah. you, you have the, the application of it. Now you see it all over the place in sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so, but it opened up a whole bunch of create. Now you're from a creative perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what can I do here to to make this game more visceral for the people that are watching? Yeah. You know. So you know, you know, Mark, I, I can talk talk with you for hours, but but I I, I think um, I also when I you know get John an opportunity to share some you know very practical examples, but absolutely. But, you know, as a way to to, to uh, switch gears there, um, this film festival, you know, we, we were just about to start talking about that when we kind of had our, our cutoff there. Um, so can you can you you know kind of briefly just mention so, so how did you how did you get the film festival you know to work in a in, in a COVID situation and 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 you know I I, I know you got some some um, you know you can probably actually show some some things too because I, I've Absolutely. seen on, I've seen on social media you've been pretty open with with sharing you know um, you know schedules you know around this film festival mm-hmm. and and I noticed that oh but this is in favor of, you know yeah. uh, so so I, I guess you know you're, you're not you're not keeping it you know secret so you know maybe, maybe you can also show some cool stuff if it's possible absolutely I will show you some and, and I'll tell you so what happened there so I did uh, when I when my internet went out I think I had said I did we did a brick and mortar festival in 2019 mm-hmm. right we did it there in Friday Harbor it was wonderful a three-day event uh, they've been doing it for that was the eighth eighth year uh, then we get COVID Right. Yeah. We get it this year and we're like, are we going to have a festival? Or are we not? You know, because it was kind of sketchy at first. We didn't know in March and then April and May. Things just kept getting worse. We're like, all right, virtual. Let's let's try virtual. You know, we yeah. looked around a lot at different platforms yeah. uh, that we could use. But the main thing then became, you know, there's a lot of coordination, a lot of a lot of planning, strategic planning. Um, and so basically, I built those processes that we used in brick and mortar in Favreau so that we could do it virtually. Yeah. Uh, and let me pull up, I'll, I'll go ahead and share a screen here. Awesome. Uh, so this is my, let's see, let's do that one, share. This is my Friday Harbor Film Festival collection. Uh, basically, you know, in Favreau, you have all your collections down the side. These are all different projects I'm working on. But, uh, you know, and even the way my, I've laid this out, this is unique to this particular project because you have uh, you know, basically you work your way up to these boards, but this is our, you know, for example, from things like, you know, social media, this is where I plan all our social media posts, mm-hmm. keep track of it. You can see, you know, you can change the status. Here's ones that are in Hootsuite. These are actually posted. I haven't gone today, but I'll go and fix these, but that's all here. You could dig deeper if you want. Uh, so we do that then uh, from a programming scheduling to look at scheduling. Uh, this is what's beautiful about Favreau. So these are all just cards. So here's my movie, right? Beyond the Fear of Singing is the one that's streaming now. Um, but, you know, it, it, it comes from when we're actually uh, going through film discovery as a, as a, a camera oh, yeah, yeah, process, yeah. right? With all sorts of, you know, um, automations in place. So, oh, awesome. yeah. that was wow! You were so fast. That, we just released that a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, you know. Well, that's the you know that used to be workflow, right? Yeah. Fabric. And so I had all sorts of workflow, and I love that feature because to be able to quickly visually get a mm-hmm. get an idea. And here I saw you talk about saving time. You yeah, know, yeah. These things I can quickly look. I know uh, these green. These are streaming. Those are paid streaming. These are free yeah. streaming. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're right. already done. They're br- they're gray. This these are upcoming. I don't have those films in yet. They're red. Yeah, yeah. So I don't change the colors. I just move the status when this thing goes. Oh, yeah, from, you know, from uh, if I'm in the director's series, I'm doing the care asset wrangling. I go to ready to screen. It's changed to yellow. You know, so now oh, I know yeah. that this thing's ready to go. 
this is beautiful. I, this is this is so great. You know, it's 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 so awesome. You know, when when <laughs> you know, as a software developer, you know, when you made something, you had all these great ideas. You know, how this is going to be used, and then seeing someone like one week later putting it into like brilliant action is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's the beautiful thing about that. So I just I've just updated this card here, mm -hmm. right? It updates. It's the same card. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's the same card. Look, now it's yellow. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, those things, those little efficiency things right there, mm -hmm. those are things I don't have to think about. I don't go to bed at night thinking, yeah, What's, yeah, yeah. I got to remember to do that on that film because what stage is it in? No, yeah, yeah. I know what stage it is. Yeah, yeah. It's right but here. Also, you know, if you, Left if you, to right. Yeah, I mean, Mark, if you think about, you know, what typically happens in the creative industry, you know, you know, film or games or anything, you know, very often, you know, this would be manual work. You know, you would have someone would be like, you know, product administrator or like products, you know, or like a, yeah, I mean, there's many titles for this, but anyways, it would be actually be a human sitting just like manually doing these kind of things. Yes. Uh, so you, I used to do that in FileMaker yeah. or in Excel. <laughs> I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. So, so you're, you know, you're, with this, the board, I'm on the board. We have a, a small board for the film festival. They're all in Friday Harbor. I'm uh -huh. here. Um, I'm doing all the technical aspect. I work with the director. She, the, the, the uh, director, the board of directors, she, Karen, she uh, does all the film acquisition, you mm -hmm. know, and then we just coordinate right here. So we know what status, yeah. where are we, you know, okay, we're getting ready. This is our next one. Truffle hunters we're going to do in the spring, yeah. but it, it's the licensing is secured, but it's not till later. So it hasn't started yeah, yeah, yeah. to asset wrangling, event yeah. film listing, you know, et cetera. And, so. and, uh, and this is done from an Island. Yeah. Yeah. So, so literally we can all move to an Island in the Maldives and just do shit from there. <laughs> when I saw you in the mouth, I was very tempted when I saw you yeah. three weeks there, I think. I was like, oh, man, if yeah. they have good internet, <laughs> you yeah, can do it, you know? No, I mean, I, I was, you can really I was, do it without even this, yeah. but you I, really it's, want it's good not, It's not great there, but it's good enough for, I mean, uh, you know, Favor is not very sensitive to, you know, latency and, 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 and you know, yeah. you, you actually don't need a very powerful connection. So it was all good. And I mean, I'm very enthusiastic about what's happening now with Starlink because... Uh, you know, the SpaceX mm -hmm. and Starlink, because it means that we will be able to to truly, you know, do remote work from really everywhere in the world. You know, it's, it's right. going to Absolutely. be, I think it's going to change a lot of things, you know, a lot of things that are a bit of a pipe dream today. Uh, and it's like so close, but, but it's going to be reality. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Mark, you know, so much thanks for, for being, you know, here. This is a great conversation. I hope we can have a... Um, you know, maybe a bit of a follow-up conversation, you know, maybe in a few weeks on, you know, Clubhouse or, you know, something like that. Um, we, we could talk forever. And I think that there's so many things we talked about that could be like a breakout session in itself. Yeah. Um, you know, just this part here now around, you know, film festival, we could, we could do something you know, just around that because I think a lot of people will be quite interested because what you, I mean, you know, you're a man of action, you know, it's like, you know, what you have done now and, and adopted very quickly to the, to the changed, you know, circumstances um we would you know you know not, not not that many you know people uh you know are things that people have been been, been struggling with and um yeah you know you're 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 um uh, you're you're a one-person army you know which is which is really cool <laughs> well you know what like i said with this tool you know the collaboration is is simple mm -hmm. uh and the, the important thing the really important thing for me is it it's 100 percent reflects the most efficient process, not the other. I don't have to alter my process for this uh, for this tool. Yeah, this tool molds my. And it, I'm constantly, like I said, I'll I'll fine tune something. Oh, if I did, if I automated this, boom, and I could do it real quick. Bam, yeah, automate. Yeah, yeah. Don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, and and um, we're gonna switch over to you, John, to to just share, you know, like a few um, few examples here. Um, and we're a little bit conscious of, of, of time. Um, but, but for the ones yeah. of you now listening in, since you are here live, you actually have the chance to also ask questions, uh, both to, you know, to, to John and, 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 and to Mark. Uh, so if you, if you, um, you know, while John is showing some, some practical examples here, if you just make a question here in the, in the Q and a, you know, you know, Mark and I will be able to also jump in on, on, on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Mark. Love your exuberance and your, you know, the way you use Favo is incredible. Um, so anyway, uh, this is kind of the agenda for the day. I'm going to share this collection, this Favo collection. 
uh, with everybody who's joined, everybody who views this on demand will have access to it too. Um, if you click, if you wanna get in touch with Mark in the future, just open up his card, right? I mean, he's using it for film festivals. We're using it for this webinar. Um, a little bit more background on all of us here. Again, click the card and you can get in touch with all three of us directly if you choose to. Uh, some other examples, right? And just talking about leading creatives in this new hybrid world, or maybe staying remote first. So one of the biggest things, right? It, and this is where it seems to be heading is people want flexibility, especially creatives want flexibility. So the ability to, you know, maybe still have that co-located collaboration three days a week, but have the flexibility to work remotely two days a week or whatever, what, however it, it works out, we definitely are gonna have more flexibility moving forward than we ever had before, which I think is a great thing coming out of this, this current situation. Um, Patrick talked about the move from centralized tools to tools that support autonomy. Again, super important, especially with this kind of new hybrid world we're headed into. Um, it's impossible to really centralize process and drive things from a central location. If you have dis distributed teams all over the world, you have teams working in different ways and different cultures. I mean, it's just, you really have to have that autonomy, but use a tool like Fabro that can bring that autonomy to alignment. So you can be driving things from a, from a leadership level, but letting the teams, the, the creatives doing the work, work the way they choose to work. I'm a big believer in frameworks. As Mark was saying, you know, Agile is very much the same way. It's plan, do, inspect, adapt. As Mark was saying about cre creativity, I guess you were saying it's observation, evolve, iteration. Very similar, right? Um, so set... You know, set the basic framework and let the teams themselves determine how to operate within those very simple rules that create that effective plan, do, and inspect and adapt type of cycle. Um, I'm a big believer in self-managed teams, especially in this new world. It's all about self-managed teams. Um, let the teams figure out how they want to work. Pass them the intent, the intent. Give them the goals. This is what we need to achieve and let those teams, whether they're creatives or developers, just figure out how to get it done in the best possible way, because that's what they were hired to do. Uh, again, it's, it's not just when we talk about agile, it's not just agile at the team level, certainly not anymore. It's things are moving too fast in this kind of VUCU, very volatile and ambiguous, uncertain world. So it's all about business agility. It's about their game studio, overall studio agility, not just team level agility. And that's the thing that I talk about a lot when I'm coaching uh, individual teams and organizations and studios. Create this hybrid playbook, just like maybe you created a remote playbook. Talk about how are we gonna handle these things like remote recruitment, remote onboarding, compensation. Is it gonna be location-based? If people move, are we gonna pay them less, which I'm not a big fan of? Or is it gonna be value-based? How much value do they bring to the organization? Are you gonna have, uh, continue to have an HQ? Or are you gonna to continue to have a campus? Or are you gonna to move to this more distributed kind of hub offices where people can continue to live and work wherever they choose? Um, and just an example of what Mark was talking about, you know, moving this entire film festival from something that was very brick and mortar physical based to, now online, completely online, it's the same type of thing for a game studio, right? Or, or any organization. You basically, the tool at Fabro in this case, becomes the place where you collaborate, becomes the place where you come together to do business, have those communications, like I saw in the cards that you were opening up for the different films, having the communications directly with a card where the work is flowing, where the work is happening. Um, this is an example of the studio dashboard. Now, these are the, again, talking about overall business agility, studio agility. You're, you're actually using this agile way of working uh, to drive your entire business. And everything can flow from all the way top down, you know, these high level business initiatives, studio initiatives, through maybe a, a studio portfolio combine like this, moving through from analysis is something we want to do to doing to done to having a retrospective on it for not 
features and individual art assets, but actually what's driving your business forward. And these can be linked down or it's broken down into actual team level backlogs or, or IP level backlogs. And you have that full traceability through the entire studio in this case, all the way down you know, to the team level and all the way back up to figure out why are we doing this? What are the goals? What are we trying to achieve? Um, just, you know, as you saw in Mark's examples, just the ability to have these different views of the same cards. Uh, you know, here we're looking at a studio roadmap. So we're looking at these same cards out of the backlog and a timeline, um, driving your over, overall studio schedule. Maybe if you're working in Scrum, you've got your sprint schedule for this particular game that you're developing um, with milestones built in, release plans built in up here at the top. These can be linked down to the team level to the actual sprints themselves, right? So again, that whole concept of driving down, diving down deeper if you need to see that more detail. Now to some of the more practical examples, um, you know, for, for creative, creatives in particular, the, I think the less process, the better. And as Mark was showing, the more you can automate, the better. So I have a couple of good examples of that. Again, very specific to these new automations that were just released a couple of weeks ago in the tool. So here, for example, you've got um, a game, video game art asset team working out of this art asset backlog. They're gonna take an asset and pull it, pull it, drag it and drop it when they're ready to work on it into their art asset pipeline. These things are gonna be flowing. They're gonna be pulling in as each different discipline has capacity into each and every stage like this. Model and texture, pull it into lighting. And now here's an example of the automations. When a card gets pulled into or is ready for an art director review, via the automations, that same card, so maybe the art director doesn't need to be looking at this pipeline. Maybe there's too much detail here. He only needs to be notified when there's a new art asset ready for his review, right? So as soon as Agent 42, this character asset gets pulled into this AD review column up here in the overall pipeline, it's automatically adding that same card to ready for review down here and maybe the art director's specific collection, right? He's not looking at the overall flow. Maybe he can if he chooses to, but he's just looking at what's ready for review he can do the reviews directly on this board, moves it here, you know, up here the team's gonna see thanks to relations that the art director is currently reviewing this particular asset. Maybe he approves it again via automations. It can automatically move, the team doesn't have to worry about it. You know, they're self-managed, but again, automate as much as possible. As soon as he approved it, it automatically moved to ready for game and then it could be put directly into the game engine. Um, if the opposite was true, he does the review. Instead, maybe he doesn't approve it. There's some rework needed. It can automatically tag it as such, rework needed. And instead of moving it forward in that pipeline, it is moved back as rework needed here to whatever particular stage needed the rework and automatically assigned back to the person who needs to address whatever he wrote, you know, directly in the comment stream here needed to be changed. And then repeat that whole flow over again, remove it back all the way back to art director review, and he can start that review over again, ready for, re ready for review again. So it automates that entire review flow. Another good example, so Favreau um, works with a lot of creative agencies. So here is a creative agency in the platform. Similar type of thing, they might have an overall roadmap up here at the top um, of their agency team collection. They're moving through instead of you know, video game art assets as we saw in that previous example, they're moving through different client you, know, you could have a separate backlog for each client, or in this case, you're just using the 
hierarchical nature of Favreau backlogs to create these client breakdowns and all the deliverables for that client for that project. Again, these, these are moved, you know, added from the backlog when they're ready to be worked on to this flow board over here on the right. These things are moving through the various stages. When something is ready for review, like this Facebook ad image, for example, um, this could automatically notify, in this case, the client that this is ready for review. So again, working with externals, bringing customers closer to your collaboration process is all totally possible and easy to achieve with Favo. So right here, um, this client would have his own collection, this, his own uh, client portal, so to say, where he's gonna see it automatically popped in here. This is ready for his review. He's gonna go through that same type of flow. It's gonna tell the team that this particular uh, piece of marketing content is currently being reviewed. He can either approve it and it automatically you know, tags it as approved. Over here, the team can see that it was an approved and it automatically moved to final art and assign the person responsible to do the final art um, based on that mock-up mock -up and, and the client approval. If the client instead maybe rejected something, it automatically tags it as rework needed. Back here on the team board, you can see that it, it moved it back to mock up and assign the person you know, who needs to make the changes do that rework on that Instagram ad based on the external client's feedback. But again, all happening within a single tool. Now, recruitment, last example. Um, again, this is illustrating that you can really use Favreau for anything. It's not just for the creatives. It's not just for uh, creating value at the client level, as far as an, you know, maybe an agency example. But you're, you have to continuously recruit and maintain and onboard new employees, right? For your art teams, for your marketing content teams, whatever the case may be. And so pull that into Favreau as well. People operations, otherwise known as HR, can have their own collection where you're moving through a recruitment process or recruitment Kanban as it's called. Have all the details, their resume, their LinkedIn links directly on the cards themselves. When somebody makes it all the way through to eventually hired, that card can automatically be assigned to the person responsible for maybe starting the onboarding process for that particular new hire. That's completely automated. As soon as I dragged or Matilda was pulled into hired, this hired column here, she was automatically added to this employee onboarding flow. Where now, this, in this case, James knows that this particular person is ready for onboarding. They've got to get the, the equipment ready um, for this particular person, create all the accounts for this particular person. First day, they can start doing the paperwork through orientation, product training. And then up here, you can always see exactly what stage this particular new hire is currently at in the onboarding process. Again, thanks to the power of relations in Favro. So three you know, good examples of leading creatives getting out of the way of the creative process you know, automating as much as you can with a tool like Favro, creating those basic frameworks, those basic flows to help them continue to focus on finishing work, um, not just starting a lot of things. Um, here we have some, if you follow this link, when I share this collection out to you, if you follow the link here to learn.favro.com customer stories, uh, the, there's gonna be a, a, another uh, a whole selection of customers who have used Favro in various different ways from webinars, from interviews that I did face-to-face pre-COVID. Uh, so take advantage of this to you know, maybe learn how other people have used Favro to great success. And if you wanna learn more, of course, there's favro.com. favrohub.com is a great place to go for deeper insights. Uh, a lot of articles that I wrote, articles Patrick's written, 
um, specific to different industries, solves different problems. A lot of good information here. And also if you're looking for Favreau, you know, maybe a quick start, get up and running fast with Favreau, or you're looking from, for some Favreau training or certification, you can go to my firm's website, bradcoveinsights.com, and this will take you directly to all the Favreau training and certifications. Okay, that is uh, everything that I wanted to cover, and I'm gonna stop the share. Uh, thank you so much, John. You know, the, I really, um, I really liked your example with uh, kind of the recruitment funnel and how now using automations for how that, you know, kind of um, overflows into uh, into onboarding. Uh, we've been using, uh, um, you know, five ourselves for for this, and one of the things that we've done is that you know this kind of recruitment funnel, we often have in a, in a collection which is shared between us and and the recruitment partner. So uh, basically, you know, I'm a big believer that when you work with a, with a partner, uh, for example, with recruitment, it should feel like an extension of your team, you know, rather than like, you know, throwing balls over, over the wall. And, and doing it in this way has, has really helped with, you know, making that collaboration very tight. And, you know, now seeing you also uh, applying automations there to make it like even more smooth, I think this is, a, this is definitely a workflow. I mean, you know, what's funny, John, is that there's actually many tools out there uh, which is uh, trying to do the same thing. And some of them are very good. Um, but the thing is that you can, you can do this all in, in, in favor and you don't have to you know, pay a single dollar extra because it's the same tool as you know, for everything else you're doing. Uh, and also it gets much more integrated in the, in the rest of the work you're doing. So uh, this is definitely a good example of also reducing the amount of tools that you need in a company. Exactly. I mean, yeah. the, whenever I'm talking to a, another studio or organization, and just getting across that the fewer tools you can have, the less si silos you're going to have, the better. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, it's been a been a good webinar. Um, you know, even though we had a we had a cutoff there in the in in, in the yeah. middle, but I think we we got some good conversation in there uh, in in the meantime. And you know, Mark, thank you so much for you know, you know, figuring out the tech, the tech and you know, getting back and 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 uh, you know, having an awesome second half of that conversation. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, looking forward to speak with you very soon again. You know, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for listening in. Good luck with the Thanks. film. Thanks, guys. Bye, John, Patrick. Thank you.